Good evening, and thanks for tuning in to Running on Alaska Public Media. I'm Ann Hillman. I'll be the moderator for tonight's show. I'm joined by my colleague, KSKA reporter Zachariah Hughes. He'll be asking questions of this year's Anchorage mayoral candidates. We invited all 11 of the candidates for this year's race to take part in our show, but some chose not to participate. Tonight, we'll be hearing from eight of them. Because the number of candidates is so large, we chose to group them together through a random drawing. We'll start each segment with 30-second opening statements from the candidates. Then, Mr. Hughes will ask a series of questions. The candidates are given 45 seconds each to respond. They will also have an opportunity to ask questions of one another. At the end of the segment, they'll each get 30 seconds for closing remarks. We'll begin our program by talking with Ethan Berkowitz, Dustin Darden, and Amy Dembowski. Welcome. Let's go in alphabetical order. Mr. Berkowitz, you're first with your opening statement. Thank you very much, and thank you for the viewers of KKM for paying attention to what we're doing today. My name's Ethan Berkowitz. My wife and I have two children. We live in West Anchorage, and I'm a, a, I've been in the state legislature for 10 years, and after that, I helped start a broadband company and a geothermal uh, endeavor in Western Alaska. I look forward to being mayor because I think we can do things to make this community safer, more secure, and stronger. Thank you, Mr. Berkowitz. And now, Mr. Darden, for your opening statement. Hi, my name is Dustin Darden. I'm in this thing to win it, baby. You know, I want to motivate the 70% of you who normally don't get out to vote to, to get out there and, and make a difference in this community. I grew up as a carpenter. I've worked as, with the uh, union. I've worked uh, non-union. So I can understand what the private sector has to offer and what the public sector, sector has to offer as well. As mayor, I will lead with integrity. It comes down to principle. Thank you. Ms. Dombowski. Oh, well, thank you all for tuning in and thank you for having me in your homes tonight. My name is Amy Dombowski. I'm 38 years old. My husband, Ben, and I have two children. Our daughter, Kennedy, is a freshman at UAA and our son, Riley, is a freshman at Chugiak High School. I have the pleasure right now of serving you on the Anchorage Assembly and my priorities on the Assembly will be the same in the Mayor's office and that is public safety, infrastructure, and education. But in order to do those things, we have to have sound fiscal policy. So I look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you all for being here. For the first segment of our show, Mr. Hughes will have questions for each of you. And we will start in alphabetical order. So Mr. Berkowitz will answer first, then Mr. Darden, and then Ms. Domboski for the set. Uh, my first question is, what are your plans for increasing revenues to the city? Well, there's a number of things we need to do besides growing the tax base and reducing some of the expenses in the community. Um, what I'd like to see us do before we can address what, what Anchorage is going to do, the state has to solve its fiscal problem because right now the state is looking at cutting municipal assistance and revenue sharing, which is about a $14 million boost to the local budget, to Anchorage's budget, but they're also cutting the capital budget and the operating budget, and that's going to create additional expenses for us. So if we do things like reduce our unnecessary expenses, find efficiencies, like making sure that the 179 buildings in this community uh, that Anchorage owns as a municipality are energy efficient. We can do that, but we need to understand where the state is going before we can d derive a plan for Anchorage itself. And Mr. Darden, what are your plans for increasing revenues in the city? As a city worker, I understand what a hard day's work is, and I understand there's ways we can, we can save money. As mayor, I'm going to appoint responsible department heads that will spearhead cost-saving efficiencies. I also have a heart for boosting the morale as a whole and increasing tourism. I like to work with, uh, in this transition period when I take office with the current administration to make some events in town like, uh, I've heard about low cost uh, things like making a zip line that I've heard Sullivan talk about. Things that'll keep tourists here in Anchorage and just boost the, boost the economy as a whole. And Ms. Dombowski. Well, the, this is a classic question. I don't think we have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. This year, we're going to have a surplus, probably about $3.1 million, and that was just on the muni side. The ASD had almost a $20 million surplus. So when we start looking at revenues, yes, we want to diversify the tax base, and that means we, we do want more property to come on, on the tax rolls. So redevelopment credits for development, I think that's a great opportunity. Make more land available, I think that's a great opportunity. Um, diversify our economy, I think that's a great opportunity. But it doesn't mean we have to tax people more. Okay, so uh, for my next question, some of you already jumped the gun a little bit, uh, but I wanted to ask in a more direct way, and Mr. Darden, we'll start with you. Uh, where will you, from day one, begin to look uh, to cut costs? Like I said before, it's going to be finding ways to save money on uh, the 
by the employees, by the, by the department heads, and to reward those things. Like if you're having your coveralls washed by a service that's charging you excessive amounts of money, why don't you wash them yourself? That's what we've done. We're washing our own uh, mats in the f uh, fleet uh, services, floor mats. I mean, there's, it's not a magic bullet to save money. It's, an, it's engaging what exists and encouraging that kind of development and, and rewarding departments. If they have extra funds, let that transfer over to the next year. Don't let them just spend all their money before the end of the year is up. So, yeah. And Ms. Dombowski, where specifically would you be making cuts? Oh, well, the very first thing we're going to deal with is APD's overtime budget. Because what we see, when we have large overtime bud budgets, that is a symptom of inadequate staffing. It actually costs taxpayers more than we're getting back. So we need to deal with that. That in itself will help. We, we are already trying to leverage technology to make the building permitting process faster. We have, we have electronic plan review that we've been trying to get instituted. But the first thing, besides those things that we need to do, we need to get a handle on SAP. It's a $40 million failed software implementation project. And we need to get our hands right around that. We have to take control of it. And Mr. Berkowitz? Yeah, there's three areas where I'd jump in right away. The first, there's a procurement program called Ariba that we did away with. And Ariba consolidated purchasing, make sure that the municipality was getting the best deals and not having too many deals. That saved about $10 million in its infancy. And if we were to resurrect it and bring it back again, the projections are from people who've run it that it would save 15 to $20 million annually. Secondly, I'd look at the energy efficiencies that we could get out of the municipal buildings. As I said, there's about 179 of those buildings, annual utility bill for those, roughly $25 million. If we go through and make those uh, energy efficient, that's a $5 million saving. We could put LEDs in 15,000 light poles, save another $4 million. There's money to be saved if we're just a little bit more intelligent about where we spend it. Okay. Uh, and the third question, we'll start with you, Ms. Timbowski. You started to get on this, but besides hiring more officers, mm -hmm. where would you look for policies to increase public safety in Anchorage? Well, it's, it goes back to my history. You know, one of the things we have to realize, it's not just APD, it's AFD. As a member of the Anchorage Assembly, I recognize that we're reusing very expensive resources to, del to pick up inebriates around town. Um, instead, we, we have to invest in the right thing, so we have to make sure we have adequate staffing, too, at AFD, and that's something that I put forward. We have eight more paramedics on the street today. We're not pulling ambulances out of South Anchorage and West Anchorage to service the downtown ar area. You know, we pay area-wide EMS. Every single taxpayer in this community deserves an ambulance. So we have to be holistic in this, and we can't just look at APD or AFD. It's all about public safety. Mr. Berkowitz. You know, looking just at the APD piece of this, we ought to have at least 400 officers, which is what we had six years ago. Now we're down to 323. And at 323, the police are stretched too thin. They're very much in a reactive mode, not a proactive mode. We're chasing bad guys instead of preventing crime from happening. I'd like to see us return to a time where we had the drug unit back in place, the gang unit, the theft unit. I also want to see us be able to do more community policing. Community policing is really a way of, of leveraging the resources we have, of multiplying the force that we have, so that when the officers have contact with individuals, they can bring the social agencies to bear to solve these problems, which ultimately reduces recidivism, reduces costs, and makes our streets and homes safer. And Mr. Darden, the question's to you. I'd make sure we don't put in more legislation like the AO37 that just recently went through. I'd be opposed to anything like that, that uh, the assembly tried to would try and put through. I, I also would work uh, hand in hand with uh, with uh, social networking groups, with the um, APD, and with the messaging group uh, Nexel, where you get messaging on um, on your telephone. Also, in community um, service, uh, community um, uh, community uh, watch, neighborhood watch. I think we could we could uh, put more resources into that to encourage that thing and. Also, salvation in Jesus Christ. We're talking about safety. If you don't have Jesus, uh, you're missing a lot. So I pray you find him before you, your time's up. Okay, and our last question before we move on to uh, the opportunity for you guys to ask questions of one another is, uh, Mr. Berkowitz, I'll start with you. Uh, what does diversity mean to you? And uh, how will that factor into your policy um, as mayor of Anchorage? A, that's a terrific question, and I think that's one of the diversity is one of the strengths of this community. It's the, we all come from different places, whether we were born here in Anchorage, 
born in Alaska or came from somewhere else. So it's the differences in, in terms of how people love one another, how, how we look, where we came from, our cultures. And it is a tremendous strength. I'm really proud of the fact that we have the most ethnically diverse zip code in the country here in Mountain View. That's a sign of strength for our community. And I want to make sure that all people are treated, treated equally and fairly. I've, I've made social justice a cornerstone of, of my personal life and, in, and of my professional career. And that's something I'm going to insist upon as mayor. Okay, Mr. Darden, uh, would you please uh, tell me how you define diversity and uh, how it'll factor into your administration? Well, the number one thing, thing I think about when I hear about diversity is the, the, the outright attack that was uh, instilled by the uh, Planned Parenthood group, which went after minority groups in an attempt to, uh, to make a population control. As mayor, I will not allow any kind of Planned Parenthood group to have anything to do with our school systems, and that should have nothing to do with public education. In fact, to take it to a further extent, I will keep a light on that facility until it's out of service. I feel that it is time to take a stand against the barbaric act of abortion, and it's intolerable in this day and age. It has no place in Anchorage. And Ms. Dembosti, to you, uh, diversity and how it'll factor into your administration. Sure, I think it goes back to the same way that I've been legislating. You know, I think it's crucial that we bring different voices to the table. Um, I see it every every day when it we talk about native corporations or bringing tribes to the table or different minority groups from across Anchorage. We have almost a hundred different languages that are spoken in Anchorage. You know, it's an, it's incredible. We are a melting pot, and I think that's a source of strength. And in my administration, it'll be something that I, you know I champion, just like I have been on the, on the assembly. I think it makes us more powerful to work together. Thank you, Ms. Dombowski. For this segment of the program, each of you has the opportunity to ask one question of an opponent of your choice. So we will go alphabetically, starting with Mr. Berkowitz. You'll choose who to ask. They'll answer, and then you'll have a chance to respond as well. But not everybody will answer every question. Mr. Berkowitz. Well, thank you very much. And um, my question is for Dustin. You've talked about Assembly Ordinance 37, which limited the, the, the role of collective bargaining. Why are you so passionate about that? Well, I put blood, sweat, and tears in this community. And I understand what a hard day's work is. If you're not able to organize and to have a labor force behind you, when, you, when you're pulled into that office, you don't have anybody that has your back. You're all by yourself. So I firmly believe that organized labor is legit and that we shouldn't just disregard it. So, yeah, AO 37, it, it was just an attack uh, as a whole on um, lack of public testimony, lack of trust, lack of, lack of transparency. It, it just undermined everything that this city has been built upon. Mr. Berkowitz, would you like to respond? Well, I just want to say that you know it's an example of the divisiveness that we've had in this city, and I think we're much much stronger when we're unified, when we pull in the same direction, and we ought to have a mayor who brings the community together, labor and and uh, organized labor and non-organized labor um, through our diversity, because that's a real strength for the community, and it needs to we need to get past the divisive politics and towards something where we move forward together. Mr. Darden, this is your opportunity to ask a question of either of your opponents. I feel that marriage is very important and, and the family unit. And I noticed there's struggles in, in marriages. So uh, Ms. Domboski, I was wondering, wh what ways have you found that, that when you came into uh, a hard time with I I ever in your marriage, what, what brought you guys closer together? What, what have you guys found that's a good activity for a, for a husband and wife to well, uh, you know, I would have to say it's through faith and through um, the family unit, unit. You know, whether it's going to church or whether it's going camping or whether it's just sitting at home and having a movie night. You know, communication and um, that reliance on faith has been a big part of our family. And I think, um, honestly, that's, we've been very blessed. We've been very blessed. Mr. Darden, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I think that faith is such a, a, cr a critical element of our, of, our, of our city and as our nation as a whole. You know, George Washington once said, it's uh, impossible to, to rightly govern a nation without, without God and the Bible. And that's something that I believe as a society, we need to get back to the basics. And it's not disrespecting or disregarding, you know, uh, different religions or different creeds or different anything. It's just about, about standing for that constitutional right and to embrace the family. All right, thank you. 
And our final question goes to you, Ms. Dombowski. Well, I'll be fair, and I'll ask Ethan a question. Exactly. <laughs> I'm starting to feel ignored here. So you've already got a preview. I'll ask you again. Pre-K education has been important to you. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how you're going to fund it? Thanks very much, Amy. There's, yeah, pre-kindergarten education is a critical piece of the, the education continuum. When kids learn early, they're able to succeed more throughout uh, their educational career and also beyond. It keeps, them, it keeps them on the right path for the right reasons. And I, I look at what the municipality can do to make it easier for people to have pre-kindergarten, to, to do daycare. There's a number of municipal facilities that are underutilized. Our schools are only in use 17 percent of the time. The rec centers ought to be available so that we, if we do the right kind of partnership between the municipality and public entity, it, it, like the state, the federal government, nonprofits, we'll be able to do more to make sure that our young people go to school ready to learn and ready to succeed. Ms. Dombowski? Uh, you know, I appreciate that. And one of the things we know, ASD right now does do pre-K education. And what we do know is it costs millions every, every year. Um, and ASD is struggling right now to provide adequate education to our children, K through 12. And I think as we talk about these programs, we have to understand there is a cost to the taxpayer. So expanding pre-K models at this point, until we do the basics right, it's getting back to basics, like Dustin said. We have to make sure we're doing K through 12 right, and we have to make sure we're getting a good return on that investment before we expand that model. All right. Well, thank you all for coming prepared with such great questions for each other. And now we'll turn it back to Mr. Hughes, who has another set. And we'll pick up where we left off. So Mr. Darden, the first question uh, goes to you in this round. Um, many people see a shortage in affordable housing here in Anchorage. Uh, what's your plan to address that? Well, that's a big one. I mean, the, I've got an idea that I'm throwing out there for the city if they're down with it, and that is to cut property taxes. If we cut property taxes out entirely, and replace it with a 5.5 to a 6% sales tax, which we have done research on with the current administration. It is feasible. And just replace those. The, the, the rent is gonna go down on the, uh, on the person who's paying rent. The, the cost of building is gonna go down. And as a whole, it's gonna make us less reliant on, on, uh, on uh, revenue generated from property taxes, and we could go to a sales tax. And it would also, I believe, boost the morale as a whole because it will, it'll make people get, it'll give people a, a more sense of ownership on their property. Thank you. Ms. Timbowski. There's so many different pieces to this puzzle. Tax redevelopment credits, I think, is a big portion of it. Making land available, federal, state, city land, I, we need to work all those avenues, definitely. We have to work with the native corporations because Akutin is the largest landowner in the municipality and the Matsu borough. borough. Um, but beyond that, we also have to deal with Title 21 and we have to deal with the permitting and planning department. When it takes a builder who wants to build a building complex eight months to get his permit, there's a reason. We're, we have a shortage and we have to make it easier for these people to be able to get through the bureaucratic process so they can build these affordable houses for people to live on. And, but you know, when we look at it too, we have to have the discussion of the Kinnikarum Bridge. That has to be part of the discussion. And Mr. Berkowitz? Look, we need to build about 900 units a year, and we're building 400. That, that's not enough. And in order for us to accommodate the growth in this community, in order for us to make this an attractive place for people to live, particularly young folks who are looking for their first homes, we need to acknowledge that we're going to have to have denser housing, perhaps mixed retail and residential structures. I think the more we can do to build neighborhoods like they're doing out in Mountain View right now where there's a little bit of a renaissance going on, it's exciting things that are happening there, we'll be better off. But we need to make more land available. You need to have certainty in terms of what the taxes look like. You need to, the, the municipality has to be a better partner with the businesses that are trying to develop. And if that happens, then we have the opportunity to solve the problem. And Ms. Dombowski, this question uh, starts with you. What role do nonprofits play in providing services to residents, and how will you change or improve that as mayor? Well, we have to improve the relationships. And I think um, out in the assembly as a community, we have a, a committee that essentially is pulling together all kinds of nonprofits that deliver services to homeless, mentally, uh, people who need mental health, people who need um, treatment options. And I think those relationships have to be bolstered. We have to leverage those that are out there providing those services because they're already doing it. But we need to bring them together so it can be cohesive. Um, so I think the city plays an instrumental role in doing that. And I think they can provide the services so much better and faster and more efficiently than the government could. Mr. Berkowitz. 
Yeah, the nonprofits play a critical role in our community. They're a glue. And the municipality, unfortunately, hasn't participated with them to the extent that's necessary. I look at groups like uh, Thread or Campfire in, the, in, in, in uh, Rural Cap. They have regular meetings where the nonprofits get together to figure out how to make the best use of their resources. But the municipality has been conspicuously missing in, in terms of its presence there. I think there's opportunities for us all to serve the same public and to do it in a better way. And the whole notion of what nonprofits can do is something that's very personal to me. My, my wife founded one. We're still very closely uh, affiliated with it. But they can deliver real services to people that the government oftentimes can't reach. And Mr. Duggan. I think we're hearing a theme here. We need to cut the red tape on, on the uh, nonprofits that want to benefit this city. And when you're, when you're uh, like a downtown soup kitchen and you've got to spend $30,000 to pave the sidewalk up to your building, I mean, all that money could be going towards uh, giving them food, giving them blankets, helping them get showers. We need to just cut the red tape when we see places that are, are trying to help and just, and just have, have, a, have a vision that where we can go higher. And, and not just collecting, not have a collecting mentality, but have a, have a vision of, of a bo uh, boosting people up mentality. The next question is for you, Mr. Berkowitz. Thank you. Uh, how will you approach the ongoing port expansion project started by the current administration? We've got to modernize the port. 90% of Alaska's freight moves through that port. It's not just an Anchorage issue, it's a state issue. In fact, it's a federal issue as well because the military depends on it and we're a strategic port. So I, I look at the $385 million that we need to complete the project. There's about $120 million that's already been salted away so we can do the first bit of phasing for it. The, the uh, Maritime Administration that was the federal agency responsible to much of the cost overruns has lost in court. And so the prognosis for recovering some of those, those funds is very high. But we need public-private partnerships to round out the rest of the funding for this. But this is a project that we need to complete. And Mr. Darden? We need to get these lawsuits straightened out that were involved with this port. The thing's a mess, you know. But, but like Ethan said, we have to have a port. It's a strategic location. We get all of our goods through that port. Without it, we're in, a, we're in a mess as far as getting apples and oranges and whatnot at your grocery stores. So, you know, you know and I'm kind of reminded of what uh, even Coffee said earlier about, about shoring up temporarily the, uh, the port. And just, we got to, and what I think is we need to reevaluate the, the, the going on because something about it kind of stinks as far as what kind of deals have been done and and why why it's not done if we start something we need to have a plan of completion and that means we need to go up to bedrock and see what do we need to do to get those piles down correctly before we move into major millions of dollars expenditures and mr Tomboski, the port well we are in litigation over it right now i sit on the enterprise committee which oversees the port and one thing i don't think anybody out there thinks is the state's going to give us 300 million dollars to finish it we have to leverage the assets of the port in order to finish the project. And it's not an expansion project. It's basically fixing up what's already there. We need to look at potential revenue bonds. The day of general obligation bonds is gone. We need to utilize that asset. It makes money. Let's utilize it. Let's reinvest that money to fix it up. And if we don't do a revenue bond, then we could do a private-public partnership. We could leverage this asset to bring the private sector in, to partner with the public sector in order to make this a viable asset, not only for Anchorage, but for the state of Alaska. And Mr. Darden, uh, this next question will begin with you. What do you think constitutes success at Anchorage's public schools, and what's your plan for getting there? Back to the basics, back to the Bible. You know. God knows everything about you, everything you've ever done. And when I heard this, it changed my life. And when, when, you, when He knows everything about you and He made a plan for you and He's made you with a purpose, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, that really happened 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross for our sins. He, he, uh, he was buried and He rose again on the third day. And if you believe in that, you will be saved. It's not complicated, it's simple. But as far as success goes, there's no more successful way to live than alive in Jesus Christ for eternity. And Ms. Tavos, your plan for schools? Well, it goes back to this. You know, how do we measure success? Is a 70% graduation rate successful? I don't think so. I measure success by our kids being able to compete, not only on a national level, but an international level. So that means we have to get back to what teachers need to do. Teachers are being pulled out of the classroom. There's too much focus on testing, 
data collection, we need to get back to educating. And so many teachers will tell us the same thing. They'll say to us, you know, I'm just being pulled out of the classroom. I don't have a lot of time to spend with my students. We have to get back to the, the mission of education, and that is student-teacher contact and educating students. And Mr. Berkowitz. You know, I think of what, a, what constitutes a quality education. I think of the people I've known in my life who I consider to be wise, and they share three traits. They share the ability to think critically, the ability to empathize, to walk in someone else's shoes, and also the ability to exercise their intellectual curiosity. And that's what I'd like our educational system to deliver. And that means we need to have a robust pre-kindergarten program so kids go to school ready to learn. We need a K through 12 that embraces not just the academics, but also the in-school and the after-school so we can keep kids engaged with their educational and develop some of the other things. We need vocational and technical training so Alaskans are, are going to work developing our resources. And we need a strong, strong university system that's world class. Thank you all for being willing to answer so many great questions from Mr. Hughes. We've now come to the closing statements, so you will each have 30 seconds, and we will start again with Mr. Berkowitz. Thank you very much. Th this is a terrific time for us to, to be here in Anchorage because it's up to us to solve our problems and to, to chart a course where we're going in the future. Washington, D.C. is dysfunctional at this point. Juno is broke and broken. And if we have a clear vision of where we want to go and how to get there, we can make sure that Anchorage is able to compete and succeed in the 21st century. I'd like to have your support in this upcoming election. If not, be sure and vote. And thank you all for sponsoring this event. Ms. Domboski. Ooh, OK. Well, I appreciate you all for tuning in. And I appreciate my the other candidates here and the moderators. You know, I, I love public service. I love Anchorage. I truly believe that we are a great community and there is hope in the future. But we need a mayor who has a laser focus on public safety, infrastructure, and education. But in order to do those things and do those things well, we have to have sound fiscal policy. I would appreciate your vote on April 7th. Thank you. And Mr. Darden. As mayor, I'm going to attend the assembly meetings. If I see anything that looks corrupt or a little crooked, I'm going to veto that line item, but I'm not just going to veto it. I'm going to educate the people on why I'm doing it. I'm going to appoint responsible department heads, and I'm going to write a budget up that we can live within and stay within that budget. I'm not going to deviate from that. I've heard a famous quote once said that men will cross oceans to fight a war, but they won't cross the street to vote. If you go out and vote, we can change the way this nation is run. The average working citizen is fed up with the, the money schemes. Regular pe people are rising up, and all of your opinions are important. Thank you, Mr. So Darden. We need your vote. Thank you. And thank all of you guys for being here. You've just heard from mayoral candidates Ethan Berkowitz, Dustin Darden, and Amy Domboski. Up next, we'll meet Paul Bauer, Dan Coffey, and Timothy Hewitt. Thank you all for being here.